Good morning. I'm going to start by asking you to close your eyes. I want you to think about your favorite food. I want you to think about when you consume your food and where you consume your food and who you're with when you consume that food. I want you to think about why you like that food. And then I want you to think about how you feel when you consume that food. Okay, open your eyes now, please. And I hope you enjoyed that experience. Behind me is a stock photo of a little girl eating a salad. And when you look at that picture, what do you see? She seems to be happy. She seems to be engaged with her product there. But you know what? I think it's a lie. <laughs> Because how many little kids do you know that love salad? My daughter doesn't like vegetables at all. And I'll have to tell you, there's a lot of bag salads that die in my refrigerator. And this is a challenge for me because I'm a registered dietitian, so I should be telling you eat healthy foods and only eat healthy foods. But my favorite food is an indulgence food. It's my mom's apple pan pie. And that pie makes me happy. In fact, that golden brown crust, the icing that's drizzled across the top, those cooked, tart, cinnamon sweet apples in the middle. Oh my gosh, it's so good. I wish you could have some. In fact, I love that pie because I often eat it with my mom and dad, and I know my mom's poured love into that pie. And I eat it with my family, so it's a gathering event. And I enjoy that social occasion. But I also know that it's the sensory aspects of that pie that make the difference for me. That pie excites me. Now, this is the challenge. We have so many opportunities in our food choices. Healthy, good for me. Indulgent, fun and exciting. And it's caused somewhat of a problem. We all know that in the US, there's lots of publicity about obesity. And it comes down to choice and behavior. Each of us has the opportunity to make lots of choices in trying to decide which one to choose and how to balance those choices is an important part of our daily existence. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to have the opportunity to gather in Thanksgiving, and we're going to celebrate the bounty of the year with a lot of opportunity for fellowship with family and friends, and hopefully you're anticipating a wonderful, bountiful table that expresses just how great your year has been. I'm sure you're thinking about favorite foods. This is, again, is a stock photo. And you look at that family, and they're thinking, like, they're really happy about this meal of fruits and vegetables and some indulgent things that are more fatty. But they're happy with that. But I have heard from many people who have talked about, especially students, who have talked about how to solve the obesity issue. And some of the concepts that have come across have been creating a pill that has all your calories, all your nutrients to keep your body healthy, all stuck in that pill. I've had another very dear friend who has expressed a different perspective, and that was that he wanted to have people chow, think dog chow. Low calorie, but all the nutrients packed into each morsel, so he could eat without restriction, because he didn't like being told no. And he wanted to be able to eat until he was satisfied, but because it was a boring, repetitive motion and, and context, he knew that he would end quicker than he would if he had lots of choice. Now, obviously, I like food, so neither one of those matches my need. Maybe some of you would find that differently, but I don't know that that's the case. So we have the challenge. Now, I think about social setting being maybe part of the most important emotional status of how we engage with food, but I can tell you I've been in positive family settings where there was food, and I found a disgusting food on my pizza, anchovies. It was frightening. In fact, what happened was my nose, my nostrils closed down, and my mouth opened, and there was a need to get rid of that product. It was frightening, not just to me, but to the people that I was with. So I know that we experience emotions because of our interaction with food, not just the social setting. 
And on this list up here are six different emotions where we actually have facial expressions that come across as a result of the food or other settings that cause us these emotions. I described disgust to you, but other negative emotions would be fear, fear sad, angry, etc. And there are other negative emotions too. But there are positive emotions, surprise and happy are conveyed on our face. So we think about food, we often think about why we like it, but sometimes we don't think about what that food is doing to us and what it does, what's happening. You see the food, you might smell the food or taste the food, and your senses are stimulated. And in that moment, your face moves to respond to the stimuli. Your brain is being activated, and your emotional centers, like the amygdala, are being signaled to what is going on. Simultaneously, your heart rate or your body temperature might move just small incremental increases or decreases because of the response. All of that's a lot of data that's happening in nanoseconds at the moment you're being impressed by the stimuli. The challenge we have is, in that moment, we're often not aware of what's going on. And yet later, seconds later, maybe a minute or so, you think about what you've experienced, and you justify that experience, and you make a choice. And that choice may or may not be associated with what you actually experienced, but what you decided you experienced. So it's a cognitive interpretation. You're unaware of the in-the-moment response. That's the box, that's the boundary. What are we really experiencing? How do we know what we're experiencing? Are we even aware of what we're experiencing? We don't know. There is a lot of research in psychology, in statistics, in neurobiology, in all of these different fields that tell us information. They haven't been applied extensively to food. But it's that collection of, of data that's really, really important to us. When we have that opportunity, it's like looking at a cop show. They use a lot of the same techniques. They talk about it happening instantaneously, and they interpret it immediately. But the reality is there's so much data that I need Dr. Feng to help me interpret this. I need big compute. Maybe not that big. But I certainly think there's a lot of information that we don't know. So we would study with electroencephalography or functional MRI. We might use sensors on your fingertip or palm to get your changes in physiological data. And we can also study the changes that are happening simultaneously on your face using those lie detection technologies of facial detection. But what all that means is still fairly unknown. And we do wish to be able to interpret that so we can move forward in understanding how people respond in the moment. And the value of that is helping us to create messages to help interpret what you need to know in order to understand what you're doing, individually and as a population. So we studied college students in relation to this healthy product called milk. Most of us drink milk, most of us understand it's healthy for us, Many of us don't drink it very regularly, and some of us don't even like it. In fact, we asked the students first, do they like chocolate milk or white milk better? And guess what their response was? Chocolate, chocolate milk! Duh! Now that's high-tech science. Actually, we weren't surprised by that response, but we needed that first piece of information. We then asked them to respond to a questionnaire that had 43 emotional terms on it and to select, in relation to each product as they tasted it, which terms did they think fit with their experience. And those terms gave us some good information. What we learned was that there were very positive terms associated with consuming milk. And they were common for both products that they experienced, content, calm, good, all of those top examples were frequently selected by these students. That's very good information. But what we also learned was white milk, that beautiful glass that goes well with cookies, causes bored, causes worried, 
causes disgust. Oh my gosh, how can white milk cause disgust? This is an issue. And you know who else, what else we learned was that it was females that experienced that far more than males. Now that's an issue because milk is good for all of us, but it's really good for our bones and females tend to not get enough calcium and so they tend to be more susceptible to osteoporosis. We also learned as we recorded their face simultaneously that there was disgust expressed on their face while they were experiencing the sample. So we got it from their cognitive perspective, but we also got it that in the moment they were experiencing this change in emotion. Surprise was more common for the positive exp experience of chocolate milk. Huh, that's interesting, very positive outcome. Now I know a little bit more about why they say they like or dislike the products. These are important pieces that we've not really known before, and we need to know more about these in relation to healthy foods so that we can help guide messages associated with these products to connect to you as an individual, to connect to our populations that are needing these products. We want to know how they can connect. Empathy for the product, if you will. Indeed, here is an expression from a young lady, my daughter, not eating vegetables, but eating a dairy-based product. What do you see on that face? I think she loves this product. I challenge you to think about your food and what you're feeling as you're consuming the food. And I challenge you to think a little bit before you make the decision. What really went on? And how will you use that information for yourself and your choices? Thank you very much, and have a great day.